Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the first in our series of NLSA best practice webinars. Uh, we are beginning this month. We will uh, run those webinars for seven months, for we have seven exemplary schools. We've de designated one month for each of the exemplary schools, and during that month, on Tuesdays at 4 p.m. Central Time, the schools will be able to uh, share their webinars, their best practices, and their information with you. Welcome and thanks for attending this webinar. Today uh, we are going to be privileged uh, to hear of one of the three best practices from Hales Corners Lutheran School in Hales Corners, Wisconsin. Uh, next week we'll have our second webinar, uh, Movement and Vision and Learning by uh, Hales Corners, and then on September 25th, their third and final uh, webinar, which is Relationships and Learners Club. All three are packed with valuable information and replicable best practices that you might consider for use in your school. I'd like to begin with a word of prayer and then I'll introduce the principal of Hales Corners. Please join me in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our schools, our leaders, and our teachers and the many opportunities that you give us to share Jesus with the children we serve and serve them with quality. Lord, bless our presentation today. Bless, bless the presenter, Kathy, as she brings and shares her love of teaching, the love of science, to the children of Hales Corners. May this be a blessing to the, to the participants today and all those who participate in this webinar event, and may our schools be a blessing to children and families in our communities. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I would like to introduce to you Mr. Albert Amling. Um, Albert uh, is the principal of Hales Corners Lutheran School, and this is the first of our NLSA best practice webinars. He's going to introduce our presenter today. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's a joy and a privilege to be here. I appreciate the opportunity to share a little bit about our school with you. Um, I, I wanted to give you just a, a, sh a short history on how we got here with science. In 2004, uh, as we were going through our NLSA process and through the OI process, one of our goals was to work on our science. Um, Kathy, the speaker, uh, was a mom. She was on our steering committee, so a very, very involved mom. We uh, obviously wrote the goal, and then together with uh, Mrs. Strunk, as well as a number of teachers, um, that committee then put together uh, some ideas on how we could improve our science program. From there, uh, Kathy began teaching our labs. Um, we are, and Concordia University, Wisconsin, um, in their infinite wisdom, chose to call her as a, one of their uh, professors of education. So she's, while she's no longer with us, uh, we have a great relationship with her as she brings her students to our class and our, our students benefit from their expertise and their learning process. So um, I'd like to introduce Kathy Kramer, a great person, a great resource. I know you'll love her. The one thing I want to communicate as clearly as I can, we are currently on our fourth time that we've replicated this program within our own school, our fourth teacher um, that we've brought on. One of the side benefits is that two of the other teachers are now full-time teachers within our school. So it has been a great way. Uh, to identify um, super teachers and have joined us. So without further ado, Kathy Kramer. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome for the third time. Um, I am really excited to share with you this afternoon um, all about our uh, lab science lab program that we developed at Hales Corners Lutheran School and tell you a little bit about how we continue to keep it going. Um, the title of my presentation is Teaching the Love of Science with Labs. Um, I really love science, and I think that's going to hopefully come through as I, as I talk and as I present and as I show you the various pictures, and that's probably one of the biggest benefits um, that our science lab program has had, and that's in teaching our children to love science as well. So often our young people, especially by the time they get to middle school, when they hear science, they just kind of go, ugh. And we at Hales Corners have not experienced that as a result of um, the science lab program and just our science program in general. Um, you see on your screen, the lower right-hand corner is my email address. That's contact information, please. 
feel free to contact me anytime for any additional information. I'd be happy to share anything with you. I can't go any further without sharing one of my uh, favorite Bible verses from Psalm 19. I think this just exudes the science that's in uh, God's creation, and that's the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. How come I'm um, not hearing this? Okay, I had to get the cell phone going. I can't hear this. Okay, even though webinar through the hear nothing coming through um, out in God's wonderful creation, we can certainly see his wonderful creation. And that's really what science is all about. I've chosen to, sh to um, pull out a number of excerpts from our best practices document. I'm not going to read them all to you. You can certainly read them on the screen, and you might even have a copy of the document. But I'm using this kind of as a, a guideline for the different parts that I'm pre um, presenting to you. And what you see in red here, I just want to emphasize that this science lab program is not intended at all and was not from the beginning intended to replace the regular classroom science program, including labs that go on in science. The pro purpose of the lab program was to enhance and to elaborate the experience that the students are already getting in the classroom, uh, even though we do work very um, closely with the science content that is currently being taught in the classroom through the science lab program. First of all, what is science? And that's kind of how I like to start with my kids as well, is what is your definition of science? And my definition of science that I share with the um, children certainly is that science is all about discovering God's creation, and, and that's what God created His world for is for us to enjoy. And you know, unfortunately, because of our sinful nature, we don't get to enjoy it in quite the way that He first intended it for us to. But there's many things out there for us to discover. One of my favorite quotes is from Martin Luther, and I just discovered this myself a few years back. I'd never really um, seen it before, and I question how many of you have seen this in the past, but this is from Martin Luther. God writes the gospel not in the Bible alone, but also on the trees and in the flowers and the clouds and the stars. And this just speaks very clearly to me um, how God intends his creation to be used to see his hand in everything and to teach us about his son Jesus. I, I, I sign in with this. Well, so if God has created us, uh, this wonderful creation, to discover, um, our next logical question is, well, how do we teach children? And who better to go to than Jesus, the master teacher himself? As we look at the way Jesus taught people during his ministry here at Earth, there's a number of things that can be brought out. First of all, Jesus taught with compassion. He, first of all, looked at people and saw what their needs were, what their physical needs were. Were they hungry? Were they hurting? And he healed them and he fed them before he taught them other things. And in that same way, I think we as um, teachers, and especially as Lutheran school teachers, we look at our children first and we look at what their needs are, um, certainly their physical needs, but then necessarily or obviously their spiritual needs. And we love them and we share Jesus' love with them before we teach them the academics. So when we approach teaching our children about science, we need to look at our children as well and look at what their needs are. Where have, what kind of a background have they had in science in the past? And if we're looking at older kids, they might have had situations where they haven't enjoyed science. So we need to take that into consideration as we look at things. Jesus taught inductively. He took um, small, familiar, everyday occurrences, and he used those as examples in, in many of his parables. And then from that, he hoped and or helped people put together the big picture. Um, I think we can learn a lot about teaching science from Jesus as well. By showing children examples from everyday life, we can allow them to construct their own knowledge and those larger principles. Who do people say that I am? Or who do you think um, my, your neighbor was in this particular parable? Again, um, using Jesus as example, yeah, science teachers, we can ask those same probing questions when Students ask us questions, our reply to them, rather than giving them the answer, is to ask them a question back and try to get them to find their answer at the same time. Jesus taught with authority. Um, and we as science teachers, we need to know and understand some science content. Um, although I think what's really a barrier for a lot of uh, science teachers or just classroom teachers in general is that they don't know the science content, therefore they're kind of afraid or fearful of teaching science. 
And while, yes, we do need to know some content, it's more important that we know how to find the answers to those questions. So I think, again, leading their students with probing questions um, with the authority of how to find those answers is more important than actually knowing the content itself. And finally, Jesus taught using stories and figures of speech. That's what his parables were all about. Um, he used things that were familiar to, the, to his um, followers on an everyday basis, and that's really what's at the heart of our science lab program is using um, objects, using uh, experiments, using situations that the children are encounter every single day and are familiar with. And as you see some of the examples of what we've done, you'll see a lot of that familiarity with um, the content at the same time. Another very important part of our science lab program is that we have the teacher's involvement in it right from the very beginning, but they also continue to be involved with that. The classroom teachers, when their classes come to science lab, they're encouraged to be there for a number of reasons. One, certainly just to be there with their students and another pair of hands, which is the obvious one. But also, they're being there um, in the class, in the science lab, they're able to make connections with what goes on in their classroom. Um, either they can say, you know, when we talked about this in science class, you know, this now you're seeing this example here in science lab, or vice versa, after they've, the kids have done the science labs and they're back in their classrooms teaching the science, they can refer back to the lab. Another really important side benefit is that the teachers themselves learn to get excited about science, especially those that are a little bit fearful or haven't had a lot of experience. They learn to love science as well, and I don't think I need to tell you that when a science a teacher loves a subject, particularly science, um, that just carries on through their um, students as well. So how did we start? Um, as Albert mentioned, we, we started with a group of, with a core committee um, several years ago, taking a look at our science curriculum. It happened to be the time when we were in the process of changing textbooks. We had actually started a science lab program a year prior to that, so this is kind of um, in the workings. And we took a look at our textbooks, uh, curriculum that we were using, and as with most science and social studies and some of the other textbooks, it's really difficult to get through the entire textbook in one year um, without just feeling like you're cramming information down um, our students' throats. So what we did is we took a look in, at our textbooks uh, and our curriculum, and we said, okay, where should be some of our areas of emphasis each year? And what we chose was to concentrate on the core areas, life science, physical science, and earth science, so, and we'll that. This is orange and has a stem. And then what happens on your list. Is, is the teachers will teach that entire section in the textbook, all on life science, for example, in first grade, all physical science in second grade, earth science in third grade, and then repeat that cycle again in fourth and fifth. Um, and then a few selected areas out of the earth science and the physical science areas. How we selected what those um, select areas were, one of those were with teacher input. What do they, classroom teachers like to teach? Um, as well as what particular areas do they think were important to teach to um, coincide with the other subjects they were teaching or with the particular content in science that they were teaching. And then what we did is we put together a grid, and I'm just showing you one section of one page, and this is a life science grid. And what this life science grid shows you, across the top it shows each one of our grades, and I've just highlighted our grades one through five. We have lower than that, and our middle school fits into this as well. And then within um, a particular topic, this was living things, um, there are a bunch of sub subtopics. Those that aren't introduced in the certain grades are blank, and when they start to get introduced into the grades, then you'll see a chapter in a lesson within the textbook that they are being addressed. That's what the C and the L stands for. Where you see the chapter and lesson in bold, those are chapters and lessons that the classroom teachers are required to teach each school year. The ones that are not folded are um, sections that exist within the textbook but don't necessarily or aren't necessarily taught. And again, a grid like this exists for life science, it exists for um, earth science and for physical science as well, and it continues down in length. Again, I'm just showing you a picture of it or a snapshot of a portion. When the children enter the science lab, they see a nice colorful sign that welcomes them to science and also constantly reminds them that science is discovering God's creation. When they step into the science lab, they'll see that the lab is all set up for them. And you might look at this and go, well, that's a lot of extra work. Well, that's why the science lab program is kind of a step away program. The students come into a classroom um, that's separate than their normal classroom um, that they're in, and we have the science lab teacher who has the lab all set up for them ahead of time. 
and there's uh, volunteers that will help the science lab teacher as well. We'll talk a little bit about that in a little bit. But what's really important is that when the students come in, they see their lab table set up in an engaging manner. And you'll notice just from this one snapshot that I've shown you here, we've you know, tried to introduce some color. We make it look exciting and um, inviting to the students to try to get their attention grabbed right from the very beginning. The lab activities that the students do are very much hands-on. So when they come into science lab, it's largely the, the students um, constructing their own knowledge, doing their own science experiments. There's a little bit of lecture um, that the science lab teacher will do to fill in the information that's necessary. Um, occasionally, there's some demonstration, but by and large, it's the students themselves that are doing the experiments and, again, constructing the knowledge. And these experiments are generally um, enhance the, whatever that it is that they are studying in science at that particular time. Within the classroom, we've also added some technology since the program started. One of those things are some digital microscopes and a smart board as well. I'm going to just show you very briefly the digital microscopes. These are one of our greatest purchases. I apologize, my screen isn't forwarding here. We've got six digital microscopes along the back of the lab. What's really nice about these is they're very student friendly. We purchased these probably seven years ago. Um, and our students, three-year-olds all the way on up, use them. And not one has been broken yet. So that says a lot about their uh, stability. They are actually coming out. The company is um, Digital Blue. And they are coming out with a new microscope, their latest version, at the end of this week, I believe. They run about $125 each. And they will run off of a lot of even older model computers. The computers that you see here are, are, thing, are computers that they had donated from a local a manufacturer that was upgrading. They just really needed something to run the microscopes on. This just shows some of our younger. These are kindergartners. They are looking at Skittles on the microscope screens here. So you can see some of them are enlarged. And that's what you're looking at is a, I'm sorry, it's a Fruit Loop. Or Fruit Loop, not Skittles, as I look closer here. Then these are probably our fourth or fifth graders that are taking a look at um, various living things under those microscopes. So you can see they're actively using them. And finally, the microscopes, they come off the base. So if you don't have something that fits on the stage, you can actually lift the microscope off and look at things. So our students can take a look at their tongues or at their ears or their eyes or living creatures or whatever it is and see them in lifelike form. Um, right in front of it. You can also project that microscope on the smart board. You can uh, take snapshots. You can collect video clips. So there's a lot of other things that you can do to enhance the process as well. But it makes anything that we do with microscopes just a lot easier than using the traditional ones where a lot of your time is spent just trying to teach, especially the younger students, how to use them. As far as how often our students come to science lab, um, second to fifth grade students come once a week. And again, it enhances whatever they're studying in science. Um, Kindergarten and first grade come twice a month. Um, and then the junior kindergarten, JK3 and 4, visit the lab once a month. Our typical lab schedule looks like this, um, where we've got our three-year-olds all the way up through fifth grade coming into the science lab at our elementary school. What you can see from looking at this is that this is clearly not a full-time program. So the science lab teacher is a part-time teacher. The types of materials that we need for this lab are very common and familiar because the experiments that the students do are very familiar and require um, familiar supplies as well. So that makes the cost low. A lot of the things you can get from Walmart, a um, grocery store, um, or even the dollar stores. Um, you do need a significant amount of storage space because um, of the amount of materials that you need to store, again, because you're conducting experiments and activities with kids from through a variety of different grades. So what's really important is that you do keep an inventory on hand. And again, this is just showing a snapshot of what our inventory looks like. It's just a listing of supplies, how many we have on hand, and where it's located. This has become really valuable, especially as we are on our fourth science lab teacher right now. So to have this resource available as things have been passed down has been really invaluable. One of the greatest benefits I already alluded to right back at the beginning of the presentation um, were or is the student's perception of science. And we've really been able to see that grow as we, as our science lab program has grown. Even as our fifth graders graduate out into middle school and they have to write their um, elementary school memories, oftentimes you'll see science lab on there as being one of their favorite things. So what we're really, we truly are turning out students that are excited about science. 
as they go into middle school and then hopefully on to um, high school. Um, some of my first students that I taught uh, have just graduated from college in the past year or two, and I'm just really amazed at how many of them have chosen to take science um, as, a, as a life's profession. And I'm not crediting that to myself or to the Science Lab program, but again, I just I think we're instilling that love of science in our students, and we're so starting to see some of that happening at the same time, which is ultimately our, our goal with this program. So one of the things we need to do is to, is, as I said, is get our students to love science. And when we conduct and construct these science lab activities, we use the 5E model. And this is a, a commonly known model that's been out in literature for a while. Um, you'll find it on the National Science Teacher Association website. If you just Google 5E, you'll see lots of resources on it as well. And it's, it's easy to remember because it's based off of the five E's. And I'm just going to take a moment and talk about each one of those and the fact that they are integrated in each science lab that we do. The first one is engage. And that's just to design activities that is going to grab the student's attention. And I've shown you a little bit of that just with the way we set up our science labs when the students walk into it. They see something exciting, engaging. They're excited to do the science lab. So we've got their attention um, wrapped right at that point. The next stage in what we spend most of the science lab doing is having our students explore. We've designed activities where they can investigate ideas hands-on. They're doing the experimenting. They're doing the exploring. They're constructing the knowledge. The next D is explain. And the activities that we've uh, designed for the students um, also has built into it some place where they can explain why they think they're experiencing what they are or what they found, what they are. And it also allows opportunities for teachers to clarify what they've done. Um, this is also the good springing board for going back into the classroom where the teachers would then talk and introduce any new science concepts. It's oftentimes called the minds on portion of it. So this explain section doesn't necessarily, oftentimes doesn't occur in the science lab by itself, but it's enhanced or carried on when they get back to the classroom. Elaborate. Um, it's very important that we give our student activities to do additional, uh, additional investigations to actually apply what they've learned in science. And a lot of our science lab activities are just that. They might have done some hands-on experiments in their own classroom to try to grasp or better understand the science concepts. So when they come to science lab, they get a chance to apply that and see how it works. Also, at the end of each science lab, we give the students ideas um, that they can go home with and try to elaborate or to extend or apply what they've learned, things that they might be able to share with mom or dad or their brothers or sisters, or just try things. And the final E is evaluate. Again, within science, science lab, we try to design activities so that we can actually assess what the, science, what the students have learned from science. Oftentimes, this is in the form of a worksheet. We don't have them doing a whole lot of lab reports and a whole lot of writing within the science lab. Again, we want to maximize the time that they're doing hands-on things. Oftentimes there are extensions when they go back into the classroom where they will do more writing activities um, or maybe more evaluative type things. As Albert mentioned and I have, we've transitioned from the first science lab teacher who was myself to a new science lab teacher. So we're actually on our fourth one right now. And the things that we found most important for this transition um, is, first of all, that we have the lesson plans, those experiments that are um, well written so that another teacher can follow, follow them. And that's and one of the biggest feedback or the greatest feedback that I get from the people who have replaced me is that they've got lesson plans that they can follow. And I'm, I'm always here as a resource person for them to call. And we have lots of conversation as are the prior science lab teachers as well because they're still located at Hales Corners Lutheran. But again, having a well-documented um, lesson plan is very um, crucial and fundamental to the success of this. Um, another thing that's very important is to document what labs were conducted in previous years. So that, um, again, the existing science lab teacher as well as the new ones can look back and see in what order were, so were the different science labs run, um, what kind of labs have um, the students been exposed to in the past. If there's a record there, um, they can look at that and get that information. It's also important, as I've already mentioned, that your materials are well organized and inventoried. All of this just helps the program keep active and uh, makes it manageable, again, as we're reaping some of those benefits. What that document might look like, this is just an example out of a third grade document, and you'll see down the center of the screen here a listing of what the lab names are. This is for third grade. And then a brief description of the 
Science Lab. Usually it's some um, questions on it. This kind of information is oftentimes posted on the on our website so that parents can see what the students are doing. Then there's the reference to the textbook chapter and lesson that the uh, Science Lab would correspond to. This information off to the side then is the date that this particular lab was run. So you can kind of see a running history here, five-year history on this. I just happened to pull one of my documents from when I was last uh, at Hills Corners. And you'll notice that in some years the science lab wasn't taught at all, um, or it might have been skipped. So you can, it gives you a little bit of an idea. And you'll notice that they weren't always run at exactly the same time. But again, this, this serves as useful information um, for when you can time labs, when you can expect them to run, and for things that uh, might have changed. Oftentimes, as you know, in a school schedule, you might fall behind a little bit. Maybe there's been some um, you know, Iowa basic testing has come in or some uh, field trips, and so you're not on track with where you'd been the previous year. Then what we'll do is insert a, a different lab for that week to kind of enhance or to bridge where they were um, to where they will be the following week. Or you might get a, go a little faster than you have in past years, so you might have to skip a lab. That kind of information is reflected in this. So now what I'm going to do is pretty much spend the rest of the time um, welcoming you to Science Lab and just showing you pictures and explaining some of the types of activities that we do in the lab. Before I go any further, are there any questions right now that anybody would like to ask? Okay, I don't see any hands up right now, so I'm assuming there aren't any questions. If you have them, there should be a little icon where you can raise your hand. Please feel free to interject at this point or at any point. Yeah, Kathy, I, I muted everybody because we were getting some feedback. Okay. So, um, yeah, you can, like you said, for everyone in the conference, you can go ahead and there's a little a little blue person icon in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. And if you click that, it'll raise your hand. And once you do that, I can unmute each person individually, and that'll allow them to, to speak to the conference. Okay. What I'm going to do then is just give about 10 seconds to see if anybody raises their hand. Okay. I'm going to continue. Uh, vinegar and baking soda. I'm sure you're all familiar um, with the number of experiments and how this is a very common one that's done. What's really nice about this, there's so much chemistry, so much science in on a number of different areas that you can do with just vinegar and baking soda. They are chemicals, kitchen chemicals that students are familiar with. They can usually connect the vinegar with Easter egg coloring and baking soda with um, with either baking or having seen it in the refrigerator to that mom and dad places it in there to get rid of odor. So it's something that they're familiar with. Um, just a very simple thing that you can do. We've got some goggles out here, a bottle that's filled with some vinegar and a balloon over the top of it, and in the bottom of the balloon is some baking soda. And what I have my three, four, and five-year-olds do is they just lift that balloon up, and the baking soda pours, mixes with the vinegar, releases some gas, carbon dioxide, and blows up their balloon. And we actually, this is a lab here where we're talking about fuel for rockets. There's actually a space unit. So they're creating some air power so that they can have their rocket balloons and send them off into space. And then it launches into talking about space from there. And you see some wonderful students that are excited here. And what's really interesting is that oftentimes you get the unexpected things that happen, like this very odd-shaped balloon. It just allows for discussions as to why things happen. Again, this age is a little bit um, young to talk about that, but in science lab, Oftentimes, or frequently, things don't happen as you expect them to, and those are perfect teaching moments to talk about why that didn't happen. The same type of lab is done with older students as well. You'll see the bottle that's here. Um, vinegar, they can measure out their own vinegar, add it um, to the bottle, and here's a balloon that they can actually load with their own baking soda and talk a little bit more about the chemistry behind that. And you can see that our older students are just as excited about that balloon blowing up as our younger students are. Toy toys. Toys can be used um, in many different ways for science. Um, this is showing the ingredients for making bouncing balls um, using glue and borax and relating it to a polymer. And again, um, I wouldn't use the term polymer for the younger kids, but all of the kids can, can recognize toys. And this just shows a lot of our toys that they're familiar with, the doctor's kit and the slinky and super balls that are all made out of plastic or made out of a polymer similar to what they're going to be making in science lab today. And this just shows one of our little ones making his own bouncy ball. Um, again, we have our students getting messy. So you know, they're, they're measuring out their own glue and doing things as much as they can. 
Um, we've got the three and four year olds, you know, surprised that we're letting them pour from pitchers of water. Mom and dad never let me do that at home because I make a mess. Well, in science lab, you know, you can measure, you can make that mess. Here we have one of our young students mixing up his own bouncy ball, and you can see from that look on his face how delighted he is to be doing this. An experiment, why God gave us hands. Um, we get into a number of experiments that I wish I had the time to share with you, um, specifically about God's creation. There's a lot of things that I do even to talk about creation versus evolution. And this is what we do in fourth grade, talking about um, why God gave us hands. And we can talk about it outside of the adaptation, that the, our hands, our thumbs haven't evolved, but why did God give us hands? And here we have students that are doing a number of everyday tasks, tying their shoes, pouring water, eating cereal with their thumbs tied, representing paws like animals have, and then they repeat those same tasks without their thumbs tied. So they're um, timing them and they're making observations as to the importance of their thumbs. Uh, simple concept in science, sound. Students love this experiment. They create their own musical notes by filling jars up with different levels of water, and then they can hit those jars and make different notes. Um, by coloring the water, again, it's engaging. It's getting them involved with this. The younger students, um, I can actually give them a measured amount of water so that they're getting specific notes and they can play jingle bells, for example, at Christmas time. The four-year-olds just love doing that, and I've got red and green water. Um, these are our fifth graders, and they actually have to figure out on their own the amount of water to put in the jars to get the different notes. Um, a C, a D, an E, and an F. And for those that take music, that's a little bit easier. They can certainly help the lab group out. But they're very successful at, at finding um, the right quantity of water to put in there. And then they have to construct their own um, song, their own notes by tapping the jars and coming up with their own melody for it. So they're actually writing their own music. And again, they do that fairly successfully. Here they're measuring how much um, water they're putting in each jar and keeping track of that so that they have a record of that so they could recreate their musical notes again in the future. Um, wonder, discovering the wonders of nature. It's important, just like in a regular classroom, to just have lots of um, things around the classroom that the students can just discover and look at their own. When there's extra time, they finish some of their lab activities early, they can kind of wander around and explore. And this is just one of my favorite plants I had in the classroom. It was a fern plant. And I was actually looking for a fern plant that was in various stages of a life cycle. So when I went into one of our local garden shops, I said, I want a fern plant that had some spores on it. And they were kind of surprised. They said, most people don't want that. But you can see very clearly the spores that are growing on this fern plant. And, and every time throughout the year, there's at least a couple of leaves that have the spores on it. And we can use, um, actually, harvest some of the spores from the back of it and look at these under the microscope. And they can actually see some of the miniature ferns starting to grow. This is what it looks like. This isn't a microscope, but this is a microscopic view. But this is actually what they would see in the microscope if they could blow up one of those little spores. But again, this, this plant continues to be in various stages of its life cycle. So here's a little spore growing and then some of our younger leaves starting to come off. So again, it's something that the students can make observations on, they can look at, and it's just kind of an ongoing thing. Another one of the things that we do in the science lab are our STEAM extensions. Um, most of you are probably familiar with the acronym STEM, Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math. And um, as a matter of fact, at Concordia, we have a summer camp program with curriculum that's available to all of our Lutheran schools on STEM. But we've extended that in the last couple of years to ART. Oh, please excuse the E here on the end. That shouldn't be there. Um, so STEAM is really um, STEM with art integrated into it. So in some of our science labs, we intentionally put in those STEM-STEAM connections. This was a, uh, a project that the students had on simple machines. This ran over several lab periods. So it wasn't all done in one lab, but they came to science lab over a period of three or four weeks. And each week, they um, did a different activity. Here, they were looking at simple machines. And from that, they constructed their own simple machine. So they used, again, everyday um, types of materials, paper, plates, and ropes to construct their own pulley, as opposed to just buying a pulley from a science supply store. Um, here, this particular group had to work on the lever. They constructed then their own lever out of, um, looks like, meter sticks here. And they had to come up with a, a system that ultimately was able to lift a five-pound bag of potatoes from the floor up to the top of the table. So that's what you see here is their group's um, final 
project here, it was they used the wheel and axle was their primary one, although they also used the inclined plane and other um, simple machines at the same time. So you kind of saw this through different stages. Um, the love of science, and these just show various pictures that I have that show our children enjoying science. This is a group of fourth graders that are enjoying putting Skittles in water and watching how the colors come out and, and try to in patterns based on how they know the color comes off of the water. Um, here we have a kindergarten student who is looking at the effects of salt water, fresh water and salt water on a carrot slice. And this carrot slice, you can't see it in here, but it has a little smiley face on it. And in fresh water, that carrot sinks, and then they add some um, salt to that water, and that's what she's doing here, is adding a packet of salt, mixing it up, and the carrot floats. So we can talk about sinking and floating, talk about fresh water and um, salt water, compare it to their swimming in their pools versus the oceans, and just a number of different connections that can be made. This is first grade, learning the basics of force and motion, and they construct vegetable, fruit and vegetable cars, looking at the shapes of their fruits, um, bananas and green peppers, um, pears, and looking how, how fast, and they, they sail these cars down ramps, and they look at how fast and how far these cars go, and how does the shape affect the motion of the car. Then they add Marshmallow Man onto it, and um, keep them on there with seat belts, and we look at the importance of seat belts and how when these cars hit a barrier, if uh, Marshmallow Man isn't held down, he goes and follows along in his line of motion. Um, fifth graders that are constructing roller coasters. This is just tubing, clear tubing, and they have uh, BBs that are going through it, trying to find the fastest roller coaster. Um, third graders that are exploring how landforms change um, when volcanoes erupt. They've got soil, so they created their own volcano here, and then they made an eruption, um, baking soda and vinegar, and they put some red food coloring in it so they, they could see how it erupts and look at how that changed their volcano or their landform to begin with. And then they erupted a second time with a different color of food coloring. They go green and see how the landform has changed again and learn that volcanoes don't always change the land in exactly the same way. Um, here we've got the second graders that are learning about um, recycling, and they've used newspaper to create trees. Even though the newspaper comes from trees to begin with, they are now using that newspaper to create Christmas trees. This is one of our favorite Christmas activities. Here we've got fourth graders that are learning about um, sound, and they've created phones, and you probably are all familiar with cups and strings and how you can hear from one to another, but here they're taking it a step further and they're having their phones intersect with each other. You can't see but all the strings. As long as they're touching each other here, they can have three and four and five and six way conversations going on. Um, these are students. Uh, one of our favorite activities to do at this time of year in fall is a pumpkin. Um, what's in a pumpkin? And this is based off of a book, and they learn about the inside of a pumpkin, and then there's a natural math connection to it. How can we count the number of seeds in a pumpkin? And, how is the number of seeds related to the size of the pumpkin? So here they're doing countings um, by fives, tens, twos. Each table has a different number that they're doing, doing it by, and then they make connections back to their size of their original pumpkin, and can they predict how many seeds would be in a pumpkin given the pumpkin's size, given the pumpkin's color, um, given the number of ribs that are on the pumpkin. So this is actually a two-week um, experiment. They come and do this two times. Uh, again, it's important around the classroom to have different uh, stations set up so that the kids can explore when they've got extra time at the end of a, of a lab that's going on. So we, this is just an example. We've got a balance set up, a microscope set off to the side, and some other activities that they can do um, when they have free time in the lab. Another very important part of each one of our lab activities is the use of Bible or Bible verses. And we do this so that the kids can truly see the connection between science and God's word. And a lot of our labs are intended, are environmental science um, oriented, to teach them specifically how they can take care of God's world. I'm going to show you how we use um, the Bible verses in God's word as we study the human body. Each year, um, Every class takes on a particular part of the human body, and so I'm going to step you through this particular year. Every class did it at the same, uh, during the same week. Typically, it's not coordinated that well. But we started out with having our um, older students uh, trace our younger students' bodies onto butcher block paper. 
and we hung them throughout the school building. Our three or four year olds concentrated on the face. And again, we used a, a Bible verse, the eyes of the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of life. And then they did a, a face lab off of this. And I'm just showing you the setup. And the students used magnifying glasses and along with little booklets here. This is kind of their lab book that taught them how their eyes are like magnifying glasses and how their ears are like funnels. And then they did a number of other activities in that lab as well. Our kindergarten did the nervous system, so they concentrated on the brain. And again, that's a corresponding Bible verse. And they had a brain lab. You can see their little booklet. That was kind of their lab book for this. And they had a lab sheet as well. And some of the activities that they did in there for looking at the um, sense of touch and where our brain controls the sense of touch, they put their hands into ice cold water to see how it affected their ability to feel things. They tried to pick up jelly beans with their fingers after they were cold. And they also use these jelly beans to explore their other senses as well. Our first, grader did, first graders did the lungs, or the respiratory system. And again, the corresponding Bible verses. Um, this is what the lung lab setup looked like. Again, you can see it's very engaging. We try to use lots of color and just have it inviting to the students when they walk in. They started out by doing some exercises just to get their respiration rate going faster as they went from sitting to standing to walking to jumping jacks. They did a model of the lungs, a very simple one with balloons and funnels to learn how our lungs work as you inhale and exhale. And then finally they looked at how much air their lungs can hold by looking at the size of the bubble that they were able to create on a paper plate. So the goal of this was to get as big of a bubble as you can and use that as a measure of how much air your lungs hold. Second grade does the circulatory system. Their lab set up. And they start up by modeling how does the lab, how does your heart work? We talk about how strong of a muscle it is and have them try to um, contract and expand their um, palms of their hands and to simulate what the heart does on a daily basis all the time. They tried to find their pulse rather than just feeling for it. They put a little piece of uh, modeling clay in a toothpick and watched the toothpick go up and down. And then finally, they made a model of blood in a Ziploc bag using uh, water and kidney, kidney beans, red kidney beans, um, some pasta to simulate the white in the uh, white blood cells and the platelets. And they learned that the blood gets its color from the red blood cells. Digestive system is done in the third grade. What their lab table setup looks like. Um, they look at the esophagus and how that works by trying to get a potato from the top of the stock, stocking down to the bottom. And they simulate how our esophagus works. Here they're looking at um, how food dissolves in our mouth, taking a look at a sugar cube and how when you crunch it up it dissolves faster. And that's the job of our teeth. Here we're talking about after food, has, how food, when it's going through our digestive tract in our large intestine, small intestine and large intestine, all the nutrients come out into the bowl and the um, waste product stays in our intestine and then it's excreted through our excretory system. And here they're modeling the entire length of the um, digestive system using different colors of yarn and stretching that out. So they're doing measurement and then tying the ends together to see that. Fourth grade looks at the muscular system. And this is a set for that. They actually do a dissection of a chicken leg to look at the different muscles. So here you see the students dissecting that chicken leg. And they're specifically looking at the muscles within that. So we concentrate on what the muscles look like and point out that where you have your dark meat um, in your leg versus your light meat closer to the breast, that the muscles that do more work as they would in your leg need more blood, and that's why they're darker in color as opposed to your breast muscles that don't do as much work. Um, they're lighter in color. And then our fifth grade does the skeletal system. They also do the chicken dissection, but their purpose is a little different because they're looking at it specifically for the types of bones and the types of joints. You can actually see a hinge joint between the, um, the tibia fibia and the femur. And then they can see the ball and socket joint where it attaches to the breast. 
and then finally they can crack the bone open, they can see the bone marrow on the inside and it makes a connection to the circulatory system. That's where your red blood cells are created. And then we pull all of this together um, with one of my favorite um, Bible verses that we are all part of the body of Christ and each one of us has our own body. And as they go through that week, um, they add their body part on to these bodies that are, are around the school building and they see how each one adds to the other. Another important part of the science lab program is that it enhances our community, our school community itself, because it's really heavily dependent on, on parent volunteers. As I said, those labs are set up when the students walk in, and we try to minimize even the amount of cleanup that they do, so we're not using a lot of valuable time doing that. So our parent volunteers come in, they help with the setup, they help with the cleanup, and then some of them can also help actually with the, the lab itself, doing some of that probing questioning um, as, it, as it goes on. Um, in addition to that, we have an annual discovery fair in the fifth graders and some of the other grades as well will choose to do a science type project out of this where they um, create their own projects and then they display them at the fair and share that with the community. And this just shows some of the highlights from the discovery fair. Um, one year the students did product testing. This particular group chose to look at potato chips and compare different brands of potato chips. And their outcome was a poster with uh, that compared different brands of the potato chips, and then they also had samples out. So as the parents and community came out and looked at theirs, they could actually sample and, and do the testing themselves. And then the group created or uh, collected their data. This group looked at toilet paper. What were some of the properties of toilet paper? And they had, again, people feeling and testing which they thought was softest as they came through this. And this particular group looked at hand sanitizer. So they've got samples of hand sanitizer here that they're testing. And then at the fair, they had samples out there and they asked people to smell them and rate them for which one they, they liked the best. Our fifth grade, graders do a science scientist exploration. And this is um, curriculum integration because they do a research paper on it. They work in partners. Um, and each um, part of the partner, each pair, does a research paper. One partner will do it on the scientist's life. The other one will do it on the scientist's. Um, discoveries, and then from that they have to design their own experiment that is somehow related to what their scientists did, and then they have to have a live demonstration out here again for when the, um, the discovery fair is there and parents and the community is coming in. What's also interesting to note, this is kind of a step out project, but at the same time their regular classroom subjects are going on, so they're still learning science and whatever they're doing. In this particular year, they happen to be talking about electricity. So what um, I had them do was to create a game board that had to do ask questions that had to do with their scientists. So they still continued learning their curriculum on electricity, why they were working on their projects on the side. And again, this just shows another scientist and you see the game board out there as well. So our science program has successfully enhanced our science curriculum, um, making it, again, as I said, desirable to our students, to our teachers, and to the parents. The students are engaged in science. They love it. Um, our teachers' science level, um, their comfort with science level has definitely uh, been increased. And our parents, they see this as a special program that we have, and they see their children being exposed to just a higher level of learning, particularly with science. And most of all, it certainly is um, extending a love of learning about God's creation to our students as well as to our parents and teachers. So how could you get started besides, you know, using the information that I've shared with you? Again, a really good resource is the NSTA website. Um, they have three monthly publications, Science and Children, that's geared toward elementary school, Science Scope toward middle school, Science Teacher toward high school. Um, every month they've got several of these articles that are free to pull out. Um, there's also a resource that I've just uh, that comes out of Science and Children that is free, and it's five strategies to support all teachers. What it does is it kind of walks teachers through the process of taking their everyday experiments, what I call the cookbook experiments, and extending them into more hands-on, student-centered experiments. So that's a good place to start. And then uh, finishing up, what do you want to make sure that you take um, into account in that special time with our creator? Make sure that you tie those science activities to God's creation. Use applicable science verses where it is uh, applicable. And again, the science is just full of science as well as spiritual associations. 
So I'd like to just close with the, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom from Psalm 111. Um, the fear is really our awesomeness of God. So the awesome of God is the beginning of wisdom, our, our scientific knowledge as we learn more about his awesome creation. So I'd like to thank you for your attention. Hopefully you've gotten some useful information from this. Again, I am here to answer any questions to help you in any way, whether it's um, right now at the end of this um, presentation or future, future days and weeks. So at this point, I'd like to open it up to any questions. Hi. Um, I was wondering about how long does each of your science lab opportunities like take when they're in the actual science lab for each grade? Okay. Our three- and four-year-olds are in there for 20 minutes at a time. Um, kindergarten is in there for 30 minutes, and then first through fifth are 40-minute sessions. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I don't see any other hands. This is Terry Schmidt again. Uh, uh, I want to thank you very much, Kathy, for an excellent presentation. I'm sure that it will have much value to the people who were tuned in to our live webinar. The webinar link will be posted on the Lutheran School Portal pay Startup page. Uh, that is accessible without the portal subscription, and you can connect through that link to the archived um, webinar on in, in the site that is uh, owned and operated by Concordia University of Wisconsin. Next week. September 18th, 4 p.m., Movement and Vision and Learning, awesome topic. You won't want to miss it. Hales Corners Lutheran School, again, we'll be looking forward to that. Thanks so much today to all who attended. If there are any additional questions, we'll stay on the line for a bit because we haven't expended that full hour. Um, but, uh, again, thank you, Kathy, for an excellent presentation. You are welcome. Thanks.